Bloomberg's resident Apple whisperer, Mark Gurman, reported last week that Apple was set to announce the transition of Macs from x86 to their own ARM-based designs. I have no reason to doubt a journalist with such a track record, so let's just assume that gets announced sometime about when this video gets published next week. Of course, this is kind of old hat for Apple at this point. The original Mac was powered by a Motorola 6800 processor, which eventually was replaced by PowerPC. That architecture stalled out with the G5 CPU, which couldn't meet the thermal requirements for mobile or emerging multi-core systems. Sounds a little familiar. In 2005, Apple announced it was switching. Now that I think about it, Apple has a really bad track record for choosing CPU architectures. A lot of the focus on this announcement will be about Apple's remarkable emergence as a high-end chip maker, scaling designs for what were then low-power ARM chips into their A series of chips that have now rivaled and surpassed in many ways Intel's processors on multi-core benchmarks for years now. But the move by Apple speaks so much about the current situation that Intel finds itself in. Did Apple really out-innovate them, or were they just aiming at a stationary target? Let's get back to that moment in 2005 when Apple announced the transition to see where Intel was as a company. Intel had spent the first half of that decade in a pretty pitch battle with AMD on the x86 side. Intel had the edge on mobile side with its Pentium M architecture and its highly marketable Centrino platform, helping to standardize Wi-Fi on laptops. But commitment to the power-hungry NetBurst architecture on desktop and server meant that they were seeing AMD trade blows with them on absolute performance while often losing out on efficiency. While Intel still maintained a healthy market share lead in both categories, Opterons were starting to carve out a niche for themselves in the HPC space, having been used in leading supercomputers at that time. While Intel couldn't always win on a technical level, they were quite adept at using creative marketing strategies to get their chips into customers' hands, and later paying some lawsuits for it. While Apple showed off Intel running on what was then called OS X on a Pentium 4 test system, the first products to actually use Intel were using their core microarchitecture. This architecture, based on the P6 architecture from the original Pentium line, would help lead the company into over a decade of innovation, growth, and marketplace dominance. For much of this time, Intel's strategy for chip families was called TikTok, formalizing the performance and efficiency increases predicted by Moore's Law into a more marketable piece of strategy. Each tick by Intel would see them introduce a new chip family that offered more performance per clock, faster memory, and increased cash. The talk would follow in a year or two, generally taking that same chip architecture and moving it to a smaller fabrication process, which would generally then increase efficiency and allow for higher clock speeds. Chip fabrication is an extraordinarily expensive business, and each move to a new fabrication size requires chip makers to refit, if not effectively rebuild, whole fabs for billions of dollars. So it's remarkable to see Intel from 2005 to 2015 go from making 90 nanometer chips to 14 nanometer chips over the course of just five process shifts. This pace allowed them to add more cores, more frequency, and save on battery life. Of course, not all of Intel's businesses were flourishing at this time. Intel has been trying and failing to do mobile since time immemorial. In the mid-2000s, they had some moderate success using their ARM-based X-Scale chips for Windows mobile devices, but unfortunately, the company decided to exit that market in 2006, selling that PXA lineup to Marvell. Having exited the mobile market just as smartphones were about to eat the world, Intel tried to pivot its Atom processors to address this gaping hole in their lineup. While Adam had carved out a niche in dominating the netbook space, Intel wasn't really able to quickly adapt that line to go into the mobile market, and always seemed to be playing catch up from day one. While it saw some OEMs like Lenovo and Asus making Android devices in the early 2010s, these often had compatibility issues with Android apps meant for ARM and could never hit the same performance or efficiency metrics as their ARM counterparts. In that time, Apple, Samsung, and Huawei all started designing their own chips in-house, leaving Intel to compete with Qualcomm on the high end and MediaTek on the low end. In an untenable position, Intel canceled its next generation Atom chips in 2016 and effectively exited the mobile market. Withdrawing from the next giant market for chips was bad enough, which meant it was the perfect time for Intel's vaunted TikTok strategy to completely fall apart in a traditionally dominant space of laptops and desktops. The release of 14 nanometer Broadwell chip family in 2015 was the latest talk in Intel's vaunted semiconductor march, 
providing a process shrink from the Ivy Bridge architecture it had been producing since 2012. Since then, Intel has effectively been waiting on another talk cycle, continuing to reiterate and refine that 2015 process. They've managed to eke out successive advances in that venerable process, which has hit up to 18 cores and capable of achieving 5 GHz in certain lineups. People have been speculating when Moore's Law would come to an end for quite a while now, and Intel seemed to be making the case that it was dead as a doornail for the last half decade. Instead of having dependable cycles of increased efficiency and better performance, each successive generation felt painfully iterative. Given the lead that Intel had built up for themselves over rivals like AMD, this didn't seem like an immediate threat to their business. But inability to move beyond that 14 nanometer process saw its red rival eventually release its Ryzen series of processors that offered more cores and eventually better performance per core in some SKUs. But more important, ARM processors had taken up Intel's brutal march of advancement, with Apple leading the way thanks to their tight hardware and software integration. In that vein, Apple's relationship with Intel has been a little frosty since making that switch back in 2005. Apple seemed to have never been overly thrilled with Intel's integrated graphics, turning to NVIDIA chipsets and integrated graphics in 2009. In a remarkable coincidence in 2009, Intel announced that its chipset license with NVIDIA didn't cover the core series of CPUs, resulting in NVIDIA ending chipset development that same year. Apple released its first in-house design chip in 2010, which again, no coincidence. While Apple's iOS devices were seeing annual leaps in performance on their ARM designs, Macs often languished through multiple years without upgrades, to the point where Apple had to hold a press event in 2017 to announce that they hadn't forgotten how to make desktops. Seriously. So with lagging innovation, what better time for the world to find out that Intel's entire line of core chips had inherent vulnerabilities? While Spectre and Meltdown affected other architectures than just Intel's, the disclosure of the vulnerabilities in 2018 did nothing to bolter Intel's emerging image. Given the years of only modest performance games with successive generations, the potential mitigations of these vulnerabilities that would introduce noticeable performance penalties was specifically worrying. Given the root causes of these vulnerabilities couldn't fundamentally be simply patched with software, it seemed to suggest that maybe Intel's whole x86 edifice was indeed crumbling. So where does Intel stand in 2020? Well, the company has further distanced itself from the mobile space, selling off its mobile modem business for the emerging 5G market to Apple in July 2019. It's actually started to ship some 10 nanometer chips with its ice-like family, but these 10th generation chips are still being sold alongside new 14 nanometer lines and in extremely limited quantities, and we've yet to see any Xeons built in that 10 nanometer process. Intel's new strategy seems to be, at least for now, conceding its ability to outprocess or engineer the x86 stack itself to superior efficiency and performance, but rather to begin making a better platform play. The company's Z graphics cards are finally coming to market, RIP Larrabee, and should make for a more well-rounded platform. Intel also recently announced that its upcoming Tiger Lake CPU line will feature its Control Flow Enforcement, or SET, technology to better stop malware on a silicon level. And Intel recently announced the acquisition of NICMaker Rivet Networks, these combine to signal that Intel is looking to make a stronger play beyond just the best possible CPU performance, which, quite frankly, it can no longer guarantee. But making long-term investments in security, connectivity, and graphics, it's shaping up to be a very different Intel than the one that dominated in the mid-2000s, and maybe pointing to a future that doesn't need Moore's Law to be successful. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Checksum. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the Gestalt IT channel where we have new videos coming every single week. And let us know, when do you think Intel took their eye off the ball over the last decade and are they set for a resurgence? Let's hash it out in the comments. Talk to you next week.